bad if you see me crew in your town. Uh, the people in Dublin learned this the hard way. The people in Iceland, we were there a year before the entire economy crashed. Uh, the Chronicle crashed. Uh, this is also true recently in Greece. Uh, things are, are kicking off there. The economy is collapsing. And uh, we, we try to visit these places. And the story is generally the same, whether it's uh, Iceland or Greece or Ireland. You've got a group of international bankers who have figured out ways to attack these countries' economies uh, using financial instruments, uh, derivatives, uh, to cash in on countries collapsing. So in the case of Iceland, when we were there, I was talking to bankers from Wall Street, and they were pretty open about discussing with us the fact that the economy goes ramped up, uh, debt's 10 times GDP, uh, we made huge fees on the way out. Uh, we're about to whack this pinata hard, uh, take it down. We're going to make a killing on the way down. And um, pretty open about their interest in destroying the country. Uh, we know in Athens, a year before really the economy collapsed, you had uh, John Paulson, the hedge fund manager, uh, meeting with Lloyd Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs in Athens, uh, talking about the collapse to come in Athens, how to make money from the collapse, uh, what, what, what it would take to collapse the economy. Um, you know, when you read in the paper about bailouts and $100 billion bailouts, it's really uh, quite silly because for every 100 billion euro bailout for a country like Greece, of course, Wall Street can create a trillion dollars in credit default swaps, overwhelm any, any bets made to support that country and destroy that country. and. Also, when we were in Athens, uh, we showed up on a day, there was a lot of tear gas, a lot of confusion, and I got separated from Stacy, so I'm immediately completely lost. And uh, I ended up going in the, to the wrong hotel, and I'm sitting in the lobby, and uh, there's riots outside, riot dogs, there's tear gas in the air, and into the lobby walks the Forbes, uh, Forbes magazine, and uh, I'm like, hey, Steve. And he's like, yeah, I don't know what that And um, so he's like, are you here for the conference? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so he's here, he was there for the International Chamber of Commerce. And they're there discussing how to carve up Greece's assets um, at 50 feet from these rocks and bricks hitting the uh, glass and breaking all the glass. But they've got their cadre of blacked out window and SUVs. They've got the black, uh, black water guys on contract protecting them. And they, they didn't seem too worried about it. And in fact, why should they worry about it? Because there's no force out there that's going to oppose <coughs> what's happening in Greece. The, the news this week is that they're going to basically try to sell a few billion in assets every, every two weeks. Every 14 or 15 days, there's going to be a sale of an asset, big assets. Uh, they're going to acquire that country essentially for pennies on the dollar. Uh, the people of Greece have lost their sovereignty. Uh, the, Mer the deal with Merkel and uh, Sarkozy in France for a new uh, Eurozone bond market and fiscal coordination uh, means that, uh, you know, in a year or two, we're talking about most of you know, Europe is going to be reporting to central banks run out of Berlin for the most part. and. Um, the austerity that the people are experiencing, whether it's Greece or, or Ireland or now soon to be Portugal, uh, Italy is on the radar, Spain, it's completely uh, there as a result of wholesale financial rape. Uh, we're talking about financial rape victims uh, who have been uh, unmercifully financially raped by, you know the names, you know, Lloyd Blankfein, Jamie Dimon. Uh, over there, J.P. Morgan, you got Citigroup, you've got all the bankers at Wells Fargo, who's now, they bought Wachovia, Wachovia caught laundering $230 billion in Mexican drug cartel money. They had to pay a small, you know, multi-million dollar fine. Was there ever any discussion about this, the fact that they got caught laundering hundreds of billions of dollars in Mexican drug money? Oh, and a few weeks later, 
Operation Fast and Furious. Yeah, the U.S. is running guns down to Mexico to the Mexican drug cartels. But it's all good. Uh, so what do you say to C4? Uh, we'll take questions at the end of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to lose my train of thought or go on too many wild, wild digressions. Uh, because my digressions tend to spawn other digressions, and, uh, and then we'll be talking about, you know, gardening strawberries in, in London <laughs> on a rooftop somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, this, uh, these austerity measures are um, are, are are really uh, the, the people are, are suffering um, to to pay for um, these banks. Um, um, financial rate. Now in America, people say, you know, there's no big problem here. Uh, we're not going to have austerity measures here. But I'm sure, how many people here have parents? How many people have a mother and a father? Okay. <laughs> They're undoubtedly living on a pension account or a fixed income. And what's happened in the last two or three years? Rates have gone from four or five percent down to near zero. Um, to, wh why is that? Oh, well, it's essentially to subsidize the, the same machinations and the same financing that goes on to create these weapons of mass financial destruction, these derivatives. They're being subsidized by people on a pension, people living on a fixed income, people trying to make do on uh, their savings. And that's an austerity measure. That's financial oppression. That's financial repression. You know, these people are cutting into their savings, they're going, they're starving in some cases. Uh, this is completely an austerity measure. Um, and, and this is uh, what, what we've, uh, this is really the first shot across the bow of what we, I believe, will see more of in this country, which is a continuation of this uh, need to, at any cost to society, keep interest rates at that near zero percent level because the war as i see it ladies and gentlemen is between savers versus speculators i do not believe in the right left republican democrat i don't really buy that that kind of tension in, in the political sphere um i well, i don't i don't see the existential threat that uh washington sees which prompts them to put cameras on every street corner and TSA in my underwear. I don't see that existential threat. I don't see um, any threat other than this primary threat and war between savers versus speculators. Speculators are a plague on society. Speculators want interest rates near zero percent because they want to borrow money as cheaply as they possibly can to construct ever greater layers of Ponzi scheme economics, derivatives contracts upon derivatives contracts, which, in, in, which spawn enormous fees, and, uh, and they move into the economy. So now in America, in the global economy, banking, which is essentially a numbness industry, <laughs> where uh, you know, if you can't make money um, you know, uh, collecting deposits and, and paying 4% uh, and lending out at 9%, let's say, you know, you've got to be a freaking, you know, stone or something. You, you really, I mean, it's the, it's the silliest business on earth, uh, and, and it spawns incredible moral, what they call moral hazard. And talented people traditionally don't go into banking because it's a stupid kind of business. It's the same thing in the insurance industry. But if you can guarantee, if you can transform all of the corporations in, in America into a model where you've got like General Motors selling more General Motors Acceptance Corporation loans because on their cash desk they're rolling that cheap money into these derivatives that they can charge enormous fees, then create securitization, then sell them overseas, then repackage them again, and repackage them again. And it's like the Walt Disney movie with Mickey Mouse the, and he's shopping at the broom and it's Fantasia, I remember this movie, and he's the wizard goes away, you know, this is Paul Volcker, he left the room, and here's Mickey Mouse, you know, Ben Bernanke with his axe, and he's chopping at the broom of inflation, and what's he doing? He's creating inflation, isn't he? He's, he's brain dead, isn't he? He's a mischievous little mouse, uh, Ben Bernanke. <laughs> 
So you got inflation skyrocketing. They're wondering why? Where did that come from? All we're doing is just, you know, creating more money, more money, more money. How come prices are going up? How did this happen? And the banks, of course, get enormous fees on all this. So that so what happens is the economy in the US and around the world goes from banks, which is a utility business, it should be, for people who are more interested in golf than working, from being 5% of the economy to 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. You, know, you can make a case that 60% of the U.S. economy is banking, banking derivatives, what's called the fire economy, fire, insurance, and real estate, all tied to this, essentially piggybacking the fact that you've got cheap money that you can leverage, and every time you make a mistake, and this is where the real problem begins, every time you make a mistake, does capitalism, the rules of capitalism say, you made a mistake, therefore you go to the end of the line, buddy, you suck as a businessman, so you've got to start all over again. No. No, the government says, what's going on with the banking sector? Well, government, it's really screwed up. And if you don't give us another trillion dollars immediately, we're going to crash their fucking economy! <laughs> and the government says, oh shit, uh, who do I make the check out to? And, uh... We saw that in 2008 with Hank Paulson. He goes to uh, Congress, famous scene, of course, and they extorted three quarters of a trillion dollars from Congress. They never read the bill. They took that money. Who did they pay? Other bankers. Did it go into America's pocket? No. We just saw recently one order of the Fed was a $16 trillion they discovered. Where did they go? Foreign banks, corporations, GE, General Motors. Did it go to actually addressing any of the problems? Absolutely not. This is the problem of cheap money. This is the problem of moral hazard gone cancerously, you know, mutating to moral, you know, hazard to the power of moral hazard. And this is this is this is where we're at now. Um, people who watch our shows and uh, follow us online, um, they know that we have come back with some ideas to stop the madness. So let me get into a couple of the ideas that we have come up with to address this problem. Okay, the most obvious one is the Crafts J.P. Morgan by Silver. Give it up! Woo! 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 And uh, Alex Jones, you know, he calls me up, he wants to do an interview with me because I was on France 24 a couple of years ago, and on France 24, because they don't speak English, they, they don't, they don't stop, what I, they don't censor me. This is why I, the people say, well, I don't, can't believe you say what you say on France 24, they're so free over there. I'm like, no, they don't understand English. <laughs> so, I'm on the TV, and they go, so what do you think of the crisis? I say, well, yeah, Goldman Sachs are a skull. <laughs> and, uh, and then the other professor's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, they're part of the, the system. And, uh, and so I'm like, no, they're skull. Uh, so this got a lot of attention, and so I'm on Goldman. So I go to uh, Alex Jones, and we were talking to Alex Jones on a few of his shows. And so uh, this brought us up to about a year ago or so. And, um, on the break, you know, he's talking to me, and I'm saying, you know, Alex, you know, you use these Google bombs. You know, the world is run by algorithms, isn't it? You know, the Google algorithm is, is worth 160 billion or 200 billion because they can search information really efficiently. And uh, so I said, and he had this Google bomb idea where he gets everyone to search the term, and it becomes number one on Google as a search term. And then, of course, Matt Drudge has to follow it because he's driven by algorithms as well, and then mainstream media, which follows Matt Drudge, has to put that on the news, so Alex Jones figured out, at least for a few months before they changed the algorithm, how to get on mainstream media. So uh, well, I'm on a break, and I'm like, so uh, Alex, you know, you got, I got a Google bomb for you, press J.P. Morgan by Silver. So he's like, yeah, 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 no, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, come back, come back, come back. <laughs> so, uh, so I go back on the air, I say this crash J.P. Morgan by Silver. And, you know, it caught on because it, it satisfies two really primal needs in most people. Number one, you get to kick J.P. Morgan in the teeth. You get to kick a banker, basically. Uh, and number two, you get to make money. So that was, what could be better? 
uh, it's violent and profitable. And um, and I don't use the term, and I'm not using the term violent, you know, metaphorically. Uh, I mean, there's. Uh, let me make this following digression. You know, I live uh, with Stacy in in Paris. We lived there for a number of years, and we walked through Place Concorde and quite often. And uh, the history uh, is 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 quite famous. And uh, I was with a professor friend of mine there a few months ago. And he said, Max, I'm going to take you down this little street. And I'm saying, oh, this is very interesting. He says, here it is. I'm saying, what is here? What's here? He says, well, this is where they, they buried a lot of the aristocrats who were guillotined back in 19, uh, 1793. And um, this is uh, what happens when you have a banker infestation problem. <laughs> a, a new technology came along to deal with the banker infestation problem. A guy by the name of guillotine. <laughs> And they were very efficient. For nine months, during a period of history called the Reign of Terror, they chopped off a lot of heads. And why? And was it a good idea at the time? Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'll leave it up to you, but the banker infestation problem is out of control. And the leadership is doing nothing. They appear to be completely in the pocket of this corrupt group of uh, bankers. And um, as uh, was said at the time by John Locke in 1790, when the social contract is broken, the people must revolt. This is the axiom of democracy. It's, it's, it's as real and as relevant today as uh, the other freedoms that uh, you hope to enjoy as part of your democratic society. And uh, this, to me, is a period in history when the social contract, as we understand it, has been shattered. The wealth and income gaps are skyrocketing. The kleptocracy and the plutocracy are running away with it. They're absolutely laughing in everyone's face. They add nothing. They take everything. That contract's busted. And, uh, the people in Greece, unfortunately, for all the rioting and all the tear gas, they were uh, unable to preserve their sovereignty. The people in Ireland have lost their sovereignty. The people of Portugal will lose their sovereignty. The people of Italy, they've got 2,400 tons of gold. That makes them extremely vulnerable to these people. They're on the chopping block. They'll lose their sovereignty. People of the United States, are you about to lose your sovereignty? Do you want to lose your sovereignty? No. <laughs> you are at risk because all these debts in America, they're not going to be paid. They're not going to be paid. The 14 trillion in debt, the 14 trillion debt ceiling, on top of the unfunded liabilities of Medicare liabilities of Medicare, Social Security, you're talking 70, 80 trillion dollars. There's no scenario under the sun one can construct that could ever conceivably pay off this debt. As a matter of fact, the amount of revenues needed to pay this debt, that is to say generating revenues and then collecting taxes on that revenues to pay off this debt, would require, of course, the lubricant of our modern age, oil. And guess what? There's not even enough oil in the ground to burn, to create the growth, to create the revenues, to create the taxes, to pay off the debt. That's how much debt there is. There's not enough oil to burn to pay the debt. We're talking about Davos last year having a conversation with the participants of creating a new global lending facility of $100 trillion. A new global lending facility. So you've got the U.S. is $14 trillion plus another $20 trillion. You've got Europe's $20 trillion. All this will be rolled up into one beautiful global central banking system and a new global currency can be created, and we all do a nice currency swap, and your purchasing power won't be eliminated at all. It'll stay completely constant for about a month before uh, you're all basically back where you started, except you're in a global depression, uh, and you've got a lords who are running this central bank who believe in the market fundamentalism, which is a virulent strain of capitalism, which informs the few people into thinking that they're on God's mission to bring price controls to the people because only they know how markets should work, only they know what prices should be charged, and uh, they don't believe in the free market. They have contempt for the free market. I've got nothing against markets. I love markets. I've designed markets. I've made 
money at markets. And I've got nothing against markets. But I've got something against corruption of markets. I've got, when I see the way these markets are being uh, treated and, and, and mistreated, it's like watching, you know, a, a, a fine, it's like watching a painting getting slashed. It's like watching a fine building being toppled. They're, they're, they're just destroying something that could work. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with how these markets could work. They're, if you go back and you read your Adam Smith, it's not, there's, it came out of the Enlightenment. You know, the Constitution of America was born the same year that the Wealth of Nations came out, 1776. And this was uh, potentially uh, a great marriage of markets and democracy. But somewhere along the line, it got, uh, it got co-opted. It got taken over. It got taken over by bankers who, after Paul Volcker left uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, you had this 25-year bull market in bonds, which allowed for enormous fraud to take place. But the fraud never, have to, never had to be realized or accounted for because you could simply repackage those bonds, extend the maturity, roll them out further, what we say today, extend and pretend. You see it in Europe today, what, did they solve anything in Europe? No, they want to just create more lend a bigger lending facility, more debt. Christy Lagarde is the same as Dominic Strauss-Kahn, is the same as uh, anybody at the World Bank, is the same as any of the bank. Their, their solution is always more debt because debt is how they make their money. and. Uh, they will downgrade America's debt. It's currently rated triple A. This will change. It's going to be, it's going to head towards junk. Why? Because America is junk? No. no. Because it's more profitable to trade junk. Junk bonds are volatile. Junk bonds have greater spreads. Wall Street's always looking for new ways to make money. They've totally, you know, squeezed out all the money they can out of all these other various markets. They destroyed the real estate market. That's not coming back for generations. They're going to take away the tax exemption for home ownership. They're going to tell real estate, you know, it's not going to come back in, in any way that we thought that it would or is. So they're looking for new markets. And uh, the U.S. Treasury bond market is a huge market, but it's too tight, not enough volatility, can't make enough money on it, unless it were junk. Then it becomes a huge cash cap. So mark my words, you know, this time next year, U.S. Treasury debt will be, you know, um, you know, double A for sure, possibly low. Because, uh, and it'll be, of course, here's another, uh, here's another prediction. Uh, this, this debt ceiling debate with Barack Obama, of course, they're talking about a big loser being the Pentagon. Ha, 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 Yeah, right. The Pentagon is going to have their budgets cut. Right. Okay. So, um, how many of this... <laughs> So, um, well, we're, see, we're coming up on an important anniversary on September 11th. Uh, let's see. Uh, false flag? Maybe. Uh, you know, anything, <laughs> anything to get, uh, you know, the importance of that military budget stroking again. Uh, you know, so we're going to see something uh, in the very near future. And uh, I'd love to tell a story. Uh, we're making a film now called Broker Zero. It's a fictional story. It's about a broker uh, in, in, the, in the South Tower, the Twin Towers, who sees the North Tower go down, and he has a choice. Stay and trade options profitably, <laughs> or flee. Now, what got me thinking about this story is that after the events, we know from the 9-11 report that in Alex Brown and Sons, uh, accounts, which was bought by Deutsche Bank, and I used to work at Alex Brown, I know Rosie Krongard, I met him a few times, I then worked at the CIA, um, that there was $2 million left in a Alex Brown account, never collected. And to, that's broker zero. That's the guy who chose to trade instead of flee. <laughs> he died a rich man for market fundamentalism. <laughs> He's a Wall Street jihadi. Yeah. <laughs> He's a Goldman Sachs Taliban. So that's a film we're making. Uh, it's a fictional film written and directed by Stacey Herbert. Stacey Herbert! <laughs> well, I do want to mention that Stacey Herbert actually writes all of our shows, the Kaiser Report shows. Yeah. She writes and directs and edits all of our films. And um, she, uh, so if you like, any, you know, she's, she's uh, a one-woman wrecking crew. That does it all. So uh, I wanted to, uh, I want to open up.
I don't know. She would. Let's see, I have my, uh, my little notebook of notes, which I have out there somewhere. I think Stacy has it in her knapsack, that white uh, book of uh, a few clippings. So I like, to, uh, I like to just clip stuff out of the newspaper because people who believe, uh, it's not a conspiracy, let's say this. It's not a conspiracy. It, it's all in the uh, newspaper. So um, if you look in the newspaper, uh, you know, you, you find you find everything you need to know. You know, the Financial Times is still a pretty good paper. So, I'll just go over a few of these. Or here's something from the Wall Street Journal in 2005, which you can find online. It's a great story. So, lessons from the brain damaged investor. Now, what this editorial from the Wall Street Journal explains is that people who have slight brain damage make excellent money managers. Because they lack empathy. <laughs> empathy is the enemy of performance. If you care about your fellow human being, you suck as a money manager. If you care about the consequences of your actions, you'll never get a job at Goldman Sachs. If you have any empathetic tendency whatsoever, you'll never uh, get a job at JP Morgan. Because people with slight brain damage are preferable. And this is, you see the generation of this after generation, the people now working on Wall Street are um, basically, um, they have that kind of messianic vision. You know, they all, they all kind of look like Tony Blair, don't they? They've got that kind of wonky eye. And they're on a mission. And, uh, but now they're being replaced by robots. It was uh, interesting today that, uh, I was just reading that Foxconn, the biggest uh, computer manufacturer in China for Apple, they're going to replace something like 5,000 of their workers with robots. So uh, the, the, the trend of wages, and as, as I was saying before uh, I came up here, you know, it's amazing. People don't, you know, they don't get it. Like when you go to Walmart and you save 20 cents on buying, you know, a broom or, or something, <laughs> you lose 40 cents in wages. You know, it, net, net, you're losing money. Uh, but you see, you'd have to think beyond, you know, that bong pipe at home. Uh, you know, be, beyond that flat screen TV, beyond that Twinkie, uh, which you just don't have that kind of foresightedness, unfortunately. Because if you did, people wouldn't shop at Walmart because it's suicide. Now, getting back to the Greece situation, this is just some great headlines. Um, rumors heat up. Goldman Sachs, John Paulson are waging attacks on Greece. This was before the big collapse. It's all written up in, in the mainstream press. The scrutiny of Goldman Sachs' role in the Greek debt crisis intensifies. We know that before Greece joined the euro, Goldman Sachs flew down there and instructed them and taught them how to avoid the master treaty requirements by hiding massive amounts of debt. They then go and join the euro. Now they're in the ring with Germany. Oh, and 10 years later, they're getting wiped out by Germany. Gee, who would have thought of that? So Goldman makes money on the fraud to get them into the euro. They make money on the fraud trading all the euros and trading and you know, sucking them into huge Olympic contracts, et cetera. And now they're making massive amounts of money on their destruction. So they're really a full service firm, I guess you could say. We have the microphone. Can you start over? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, how's my, can people hear me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so uh, oh, here's a good one. Uh, oh, no, we'll do the mic. I'll do some q and I guess, and we'll do the mic then. How about that? Okay? Yeah, so here's the buyer uh, went to every store in the city. Yeah, it, okay. Here's a good one. The uh, Citigroup trader faces inquiry over Greek debt rumors. So here's a blatant example of false rumors being circulated in Citigroup to create volatility to profit from uh, chaos in the market. That is horrible for the Greek people. And yet it's great for Citigroup, so it's seen as great for the economy. It's great because Citigroup, because they're, you know, they're lords, our master, uh, what's good for them must be great for us. And the fact that they're, you know, spreading false rumors to create volatility, to trade off that volatility, and the people now suffer an austerity measure. Well, they're the losers. I, I read The Fountainhead. I read Atlas Shrugged. This is the way it works, right? It's winners and losers. I mean, they don't have enough brain damage to succeed in this economy. <laughs> So here's, uh, oh, this is a, I mentioned Tony Blair earlier. This is an interesting story you may, 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 may or may not have uh, got caught on to. Um, <clears throat> you know, Tony Blair, when he was serving as uh, prime minister in number 10 Downing Street in London, and, 
There was a huge uh, problem because BAE, British Aerospace, was caught in a huge slush fund uh, deal with uh, Prince Bandar and the folks over there in uh, Saudi Arabia. And um, the serious fraud office launched an investigation. A judge in the UK, Judge Patel, uh, okayed it for prosecution. Prince Bandar went to number 10 Downing Street and uh, to a sitting prime minister said, if you don't call off this investigation into our slush fund, I cannot guarantee that another 7-7 like bus bombing won't happen again in London. Wow. This is in the Financial Times, fully documented. Use those words exactly. There was outrage for a couple of days, totally forgotten. What was the name of the article again? The title? This is Prince Google? Bandar, Tony Blair, Slush Fund, BAE. It was, it was a story for about a week. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, they very, the serious fraud office, they totally let that go. And, you know, the regulators are obviously asleep at the switch. The SEC covers the Bernie Madoff fraud. They got letters several times from folks detailing the nature of that fraud, never never followed up on it. Uh, the regulators are kept purposefully, um, you know, uh, like mushrooms, right? They're kept in the dark and they feed them shit. Right? <laughs> that, that's the regulatory agencies in, in uh, Britain and America and around the world. Uh, so, um, here we go, I'm just going to cover some, so, uh, some, some good ones here. Oh, here's the, the Greek Prime Minister is saying that the rating agencies are running our lives, which is true. I mean, the rating agencies, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch, if you think about their roles in the last couple of years, um, they were completely late in downgrading this paper. Then when the crisis begins, they come in late and they like pile on to the situation. They're making it worse. They're totally conflicted. They work for the people who are they're supposed to be regulating. It's a total um, racket between rating agencies, investment banks, fund managers, the press, CNBC. You know, all these people are basically on part of a racket. And one of the reasons we don't have any good prosecution so far is because nobody is uh, prosecuting this as a racket. You know, because the second you go after one of these elements in the racket, then they, they squeeze in the balloon, right? It pops up somewhere else in the racket. You have to go after this as a racket. It's racketeering, it's price fixing, it's wholesale fraud. And uh, until somebody launches that kind of uh, prosecution, we're not, not going to get rid of our banker infestation problem. Until people say, you know what, fuck it, dust off the guillotines, we'll take care of it ourselves. I mean, that's what we're talking about. People ultimately, the frustration level is going to get high, and people are saying, I've had it, fuck you. I mean, you hear it all the time now. People are just like, what the fuck, man, this is ridiculous. You, you, you know, I'm not getting what's going on. The people in the street, Hello. Can't, Hello. People in the street can't hear you. I got to the decapitation part. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I can't. I've got to like, work this. Uh, okay. Here's, a, here's another, uh, another interesting story. Um, you know, they're, they're covering high-frequency trading. High frequency training is you know, something something new on, on the on the uh, bilking uh, horizon, on the pilfering horizon. See, high, high frequency trading is um, it, it, it's absurd that this is allowed to continue because it, by the very nature of how they describe it, you know, it's a fraud. It's that these firms like a Goldman they need to co-locate their servers closer to the exchange to gain another fraction of an instant of a second to front run that massive pipeline of water coming through to siphon that cash now if these guys were in your neighborhood siphoning gas out of your car you would be upset so why are we upset that they're siphoning cash from our exchange? That's all they're doing. $100 million a day is being siphoned off the exchange using these types of programs. That's obviously money that could be better spent. Um, and um, when one of the high-frequency trading algo guys was caught leaving the country, you know, they, they held him for a bit. They, they took a, he's actually now, I think, going to jail. But, yeah, the whistle, so, you know, he, they, they, they had a, a statement from Goldman saying, well, of course you can use this to manipulate markets. And so they basically, you know, of course you can use it to manipulate markets. You think the markets, as I was saying before, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of the Enlightenment and some of the thinking that came out of it, which includes free laissez-faire type free market capitalism. The thing about markets 
is that there's a thing called price discovery, where, oh, a lot of buyers come in, and a lot of sellers come in, and as a ver by the action of their interaction, there's a price. And it's a mutually beneficial price to both parties. So it's better than having somebody sit in the middle trying to figure out the best price based on what they believe is the best interest. But it works. So um, if you have a system where this 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 system uh, is, is 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 turned around, so instead of prices being the result that come at the end of the price discovery process, you have prices determined before. So the traders on Wall Street, they determine what price they want silver to be at. They figure out the price, what they want the S&P futures contract to be at. They want what price do they want the various indexes to trade at. Then they create algorithms to take the market to those prices. So that's not anything remotely connected to free market capitalism or laissez-faire markets or price discovery or anything that should be tolerated in any way. It's price manipulation. And the fact that they make a lot of money doing it and they book themselves huge profits at the end of the year and huge Christmas bonuses and they can say, see, we're making a lot of money, therefore we're doing the right thing. Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really make any sense. But um, unfortunately, you know, these issues are not well understood by leadership, and you know, our current leadership is uh, is financially illiterate. You know, you've got he he held over guys like Larry Summers, and he held over guys like Tim Geithner, and those guys are part of the problem. They're not interested in correcting the systemic errors that are that are that are that are destroying the the economy, and and you know, you can see it every day. What's happening in the economy? It's it's, it's completely uh, being destroyed. Uh, all right, come on over. Flash flash crash. I like this. Uh, proposals to avoid new flash crash draw strong opposition. So so occasionally when the computers get screwed up, they have what's called a flash crash. You know, there's a 10, 20 percent markdown in, in a heartbeat. It's obviously wrong. It's obviously broken. You know, if you have a car crash. You know, you don't then try to spend all your day lobbying to relax rules so that um, it's easier for people to crash their cars. And yet this is what you have going on right now. It's obviously broken, and what they're doing is they're making it easier to crash because these guys all have, are in positions to collect rent from the poor victims of these accidents and uh, increase their spread and, and political influence and the ability to, re, to redefine the regulatory environment and to just confiscate massive wealth. And it's just it's getting worse and worse. Uh, anyway. Did the algo guy have a fat finger? Hold up. <laughs> well, anyway, I'd like to go on and on on this. And uh, so what I think might make sense is uh, maybe open it up to, uh, to you all. Um, I mean, I can go on like this for a while, but, you know, it's kind of hot. I think you get the basic idea of what I'm saying here. Um, so I think it might make sense to, uh, to, to, to open it up a little bit and we can chat about stuff. Does that sound uh, good? Like a good idea? Yeah. Yeah, onto that? Okay. So um, maybe somebody can bring me a little water uh, over here. Uh, be nice at some point. And so for this part of the program, I'm just going to say thank you. And then, so thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Woo!